It's a pleasure to be working tonight with two entities with whom Nasser has had long and fruitful relations, the Mashtots Chair in Armenian Studies at Harvard and the Zorian Institute. These three entities have worked together in the past to present lectures, including a couple of lectures by Professor Akjan at Harvard, when his earlier books, From Empire to Republic and A Shameful Act, were published. And before asking Professor Russell, the Mashtots Chair, to come to the lectern to introduce our speaker tonight, I want to welcome Narini Badalian, who will say some words on behalf of the Zorian Institute and the fact that we're disappointed that George Sherinian couldn't make the trip down from Toronto doesn't mean we are happy to welcome Narini here. So, Narini, the microphone is on yours. It's a full house. Um, thank you for being here this evening, and I'd like to also thank the participating organizations, the Mashtos Chair in Armenian Studies at Harvard University, and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. So I'm just going to ask for five minutes of your time, um, because I'd like to provide a little bit of background information on the preparation of judgment at Istanbul, and Zorian's involvement with the Common Body of Knowledge project, of which this book is an important part. The Common Body of Knowledge project is the creation of Professor Tanit Akçam. The objective of this project is to provide knowledge that will be shared by Turkish and Armenian civil societies and Western scholarship. The project aims to identify, collect, analyze, transliterate, translate, edit, and publish authoritative, universally recognized original archival documents on the history of the events surrounding 1915 in Turkish, Armenian, English, and other languages as appropriate. The work is difficult, requiring advanced knowledge of the Sutherland German and Ottoman Arabic scripts, the special diplomatic languages used, and the history and politics of the period. This long-term project will take many years to complete and requires enormous human and financial resources. Despite the difficulty, the work must be, must be done as denial and distortion of history are a major stumbling block to dialogue between Turks and Armenians, and therefore peace, security, and progress in the region. Without dealing with this history, prejudice and hatred will be perpetuated with unforeseen consequences for generations to come. The more such documents are available, available to Turkish society, the more it will be empowered with knowledge and confidence to question narratives imposed by the state. Restoring accurate historical memory will benefit not only Turkish society, but also Armenian society. Both will be emancipated from the straitjacket of the past. Such a common body of knowledge will lead to an understanding of each other, act as a catalyst for dialogue, and serve as a precursor to the normalization of relations between the two societies. This work can only be achieved through the systematic and continued efforts of dedicated professionals with staff and independent scholars and appropriate financial resources. This is such a large undertaking in terms not only of resources, but also consequences, that it must be supported by all Armenians. So I'd just like to mention a final element of the project, which is um, the Istanbul Press Project. Um, so there's a necessity to provide information that will be considered completely unimpeachable by Turkish society. So there's three primary sources that we've been concentrating on, and that includes the Ottoman archives, the archives of Imperial Germany, who, as you know, were the military and political allies of the Ottoman Empire during the First World War, and Ottoman language newspapers published in Constantinople after World War I, during the armistice period, when there was no censorship of the press. Now, we knew about the information to be found in newspapers because during his study of the military tribunals prosecuting the perpetrators of the genocide, Professor Akcham had come across a French language newspaper published by Armenians in Constantinople called Renaissance. It provided interesting details not around sorry. It provided interesting details not found in the official government records of the trials which were being reported by other Ottoman language newspapers. In the year two thousand, the Zorian Institute raised the necessary funds to embark on a long, complex and confidential project to collect and digitize all the articles relating to the Armenian genocide published in the Ottoman newspapers. We discovered that while the official government record of the military tribunals, the Takvim i Vekai, documents 12 trials, the newspapers provide us details on 62. This includes day-by-day -day eyewitness testimony from the witness stand 
in judgment at Istanbul for the first time, information from the Ottoman newspapers has been utilized to reconstruct these trials. Future studies on the trials are planned, such as the volume on the trials for crimes committed against Armenians in Trabzon and Yozgat. Such important projects are large, complex, and as you can imagine, expensive undertakings. They can only be accomplished with the support of people like you. Thank you. I'd like to now ask uh, Professor Russell, Mashtot's professor of Armenian at Harvard, to come on up and introduce the Robert Aram and Marian Kalustian and Stephen and Marian Mugar chair at Clark University. Professor Russell. Friends, Professor Akcham, I invite you to imagine a counterfactual historical fiction, an alternate reality, a nightmare. Supposing Nazi Germany has committed the crimes of the Holocaust and then has then lost the war, a new German government, supported by the Allies, takes power and begins to bring the culprits of the final solution to trial. Let us say at Nuremberg, only instead of a trial held by the Allies, it's a trial held by the new German government. But the Cold War between the Western powers and the Soviets begins earlier, let's say 1946, than was the case in fact. As a result, Allied control over the defeated country falters as the great powers compete with each other. Elements of the Nazi military and state apparatus, from the Wehrmacht, the SS, and Gestapo, regroup. They begin a war of reconquest which unites most Germans behind them, unrepentant, and take over much lost territory, including the killing fields where the extermination camps had been which they then obliterate. They repudiate the trials that were held by the short-lived Allied-sponsored post-war administration and create what purports to be a new Germany, presenting themselves as a stable and increasingly prosperous if strictly disciplined society that is, moreover, pro-Western, a bulwark against communist expansion. They are savvy politicians, however, and as a price for joining the Americans against the Russians, they deny the Holocaust ever happened and insist that Washington does the same, and it accedes to their desires. The new Germany then manufactures a warped version of history of the events of the war, citing the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, for instance, as a proof that the Jews, their victims, were in fact dangerous and disloyal. Yes, they admit, it was a pity that a few died, not very many, but some. But then many Germans died as well, and these were merely wartime conditions. Widespread prejudice makes the lie very easy to swallow, since the Allies had never done anything to stop the Holocaust in the first place, or to rescue any of its victims. And the world, anxious for peace and quiet after yet another war, acquiesces. A century passes. There are no feature films about the final solution. And there is only one novel, which nearly nobody reads. A few German novelists have raised their voices, timidly, about Nazi crime but have endured legal harassment for defamation of their country, for insulting Germanness. Every American president, after courting the Jewish vote in the primaries by promising to recognize the genocide, goes back on his word the instant he takes office, and secretaries of state gently aver that historical controversies are best left to academic debate by specialists. One German historian, imprisoned in his homeland, escapes. He resolves to study the Holocaust, and the more he looks, the more he finds, publishing one book after another, first in his native German, 
than in European languages. He even writes a monograph about the record of those long ago aborted, forgotten trials at a place called Nuremberg. He's a modest, studious man, simple in his courage, speaking openly, never once complaining of the hardships and peregrinations that his quests for the truth have caused him. Change the names. We've all played this mental game. Jew to Armenia and Germany to Turkey, and it's today. We play this game in an effort to wake those around us to the waking nightmare of the real world that we are actually living in today. The real world is anxious for peace and quiet. It does not want to know, and anyhow, it was all a long time ago. And what the sleepwalkers do not understand is that the longer a crime is covered up, the worse its effects become. Indifference emboldens murderers and encourages new criminals, and genocides become ever more frequent over more and more of the globe. So what began as sin and became the policy of criminals has now become, and there's no denying it, a part of the human psyche at large, a part of everyday events. Ask yourselves, Rwanda, Kosovo, Bosnia, Darfur, what's going on in Syria as we speak with no one raising a finger to help. Thousands, thousands, millions of people, no one doing anything, a few words. It started out as a crime and it's now become ordinary everyday life because it's never punished. Genocide, starting with the Armenian genocide, has not merely changed politics, as you see. It has changed human nature. We have witnessed a transformation of the nature of human beings in the last century, and has compromised the essence of civilization in ways we may only just be starting to sense because we are within the process. It's hard to stand outside it. So what is to be done in the face of this metamorphosis which is in its way far worse than any reverie of Kafka, worse than the transformation of a man overnight into an insect. We've seen the transformation over a century of the dominant race of the planet into systematic murderers. For insects, the majority population of this planet, do not imagine mass murder. So what are we to do? Well. It seems to me the necessity is to resist the transformation, to resist the numbing quality, the novocaine of indifference, to hold keenly and consciously to the truth and the right, and to do so knowing that to do anything else is to surrender the very notion of living. The Turkish poet Nazim Hikmet, a communist who died in exile in Moscow nearly 50 years ago, wrote that you must live as though one never died, that is to say, without any sense of futility, without despair, even without gloom. I have a Turkish scholar who is the hero of my story, better than the one in the fiction. This is a man who broke out of prison, wrote tirelessly, moved from one place of exile to another, who has written of all the crimes, of all the trials, and they really did take place, after World War I, in Constantinople, before the Kemalist takeover, before the century-long cover-up. But I also know how he drives a car, how he and his daughter sit at a dinner table, how he drinks Rocky, how he enjoys his friend's company. Have you heard of a novel about a Swedish journalist who, assisted by a young girl with a dragon tattoo, investigates a murder two generations before that most people would rather conveniently forget? As their work progresses, they are threatened, finding out about other related murders that were not so long ago, that have been happening up until now because the first killer had a disciple 
because he wasn't brought to justice and then no one else was and the murders multiplied. That was one, and the longer justice lay dormant, the worse matters became. And the murder of a whole nation, a cover-up a century old, accomplices not just in Ankara, but in the White House and in the State Department. Bestsellers fade before the reality of the historian who takes on this kind of a topic. But the, the obstacles are endless, the conspiracy of silence is immensely tenacious, and you wonder, will we ever bring the villains to justice? Not in the girl with the dragon tattoo, but in reality, here, now? Yes, one has to. The time will come when the truth will be victorious. And as Christ promised, it really will set us free, because we are not free now. In a short time, it will be a hundred years since 1915, and the last known veteran of World War I died only a few days before I wrote these lines. An almost forgotten film about the almost forgotten heroes of the Spanish Civil War is called The Good Fight. The Abraham Lincoln Brigade from the United States fought that good fight, but they lost it. The fascists won in Spain, but the survivors did not surrender. Many got up to fight again in the Second World War. The lesson of a good fight is that you keep on fighting even if you lose because of the price of not fighting at all. Professor Taner Akcham will keep on fighting. The gentle, humorous, brilliant Orhan Pamuk has faced arrest for his words, for insulting Turkishness. Nazem Hikmet died in exile, but he lives undefeated in his poems. Every man and woman in Turkey who holds up a sign says, that says, Biz Ermeniz, we're Armenians, bids us carry on. Students like my pupil who is sitting here, Akun Sefer, this year remind you and me that it's worth trying, hope against hope, to play the man as Latimer bade Master Ridley on a dire morning in England centuries ago. To light a fire that will never go out. The man you're about to hear is a fighter in the good fight. I believe the time will come when not to honor these witnesses for the truth will be what is considered a crime against Turkishness. Mm -hmm. When looking at these extraordinary people, everyone in the world will be able to say, Nemutlu Türkum DNA. How fortunate is he who can say, I am a Turk. And that metamorphosis is on its way. No noble task was ever easy, proclaims a motto of the Scottish Labour Party. And if you are in this, then you are in for the long haul. Think of this country. Remember slavery, segregation, lynch mobs, then Rosa Parks not giving up her seat on the bus, then the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, whom I saw with my own eyes when I was a kid and my dad was his lawyer, how he said just before he was murdered, and I heard him say that too. He said, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. That is what I think of when I think of the Armenian cause a hundred years on. And though some of the oppressed of the earth have come a long way, there are many more and a long way to go. This isn't just about you. This is about the whole planet. Sometimes it seems very dark. When Dr. King passed, I did not think I'd ever see right in front of me again a hero of the mind and the spirit, a champion of human liberation and of truth. I saw Taner Akcham in a Dutch TV documentary, The Wall of Silence, but that was on the screen. I watched it about 20 times. God always has other plans. And it turned out one not only met the man, but as I said, drank more than one glass of Raki with him under my own roof. And God willing, we'll raise our glasses again soon. Taner reminds me and reminds us all what the word of the traditional toast really is about sheref nizeh, to your honor. True scholarship is the essence of honor in a man, of courage to fight the good fight, of caring for the oppressed, of service to mankind, 
to nature and to nature's God. It examines the reasons and causes of events without fear or prejudice and wakes the world from sleep. Here, in a corner of the real world, in this, in this company of the working people of this community of students, on behalf of the Mashtuts Chair in Armenian Studies of Harvard University, I have the high privilege and distinct honor to introduce a scholar, a fighter, a man, and most of all my friend, Professor Taner Akcham of Clark University. jump over it. And I thank Zorian Institute, Nairi, thank you very much, and Nasser and Mark for this invitation. And it is really a great pleasure for me to, to talk about the book. Uh, and uh, then we can discuss some other aspects that you want to know about the book. Uh, let me give you first some uh, basic information about the book. As you see here, there is a Turkish edition and the English edition of the book, and the Turkish is uh, three times bigger than the English one. And uh, what is the reason? Uh, I'll give you some uh, background information. In English edition, we put only uh, the verdicts and indictments of nine trials. And in Turkish one, we have uh, the verdicts and indictments of 13 trials, plus the uh, protocols of the different sessions. Altogether, uh, 12 different sessions from different trials uh, was, or has been also uh, put in the Turkish version. The reason uh, for this difference is the money. Uh, we didn't have enough. Zorian didn't have enough material uh, uh, to cover the t cost of the translation. So uh, we had to restrict ourselves for the English edition uh, into uh, nine verdicts. So a short story of the book. The book has its own history also. Uh, it started actually with my first uh, encounter with Bahakan Dadrian, 1990. He was my mentor, and I was working in uh, Hamburg on my uh, doctoral thesis, and it was also on the trials in Istanbul, 1919-1922. And when Dadrian and I came together, it was for us not difficult to put the Takrim Vekais that we had. He had some copies, I had some copies. We put together, and so then we had a complete set of the uh, trials uh, which had been published in Takrim Vekai. And uh, this job was actually completed between 1991-94. And uh, at first, our information about the trials were predominantly limited to the Istanbul ones. We all thought that the trials occurred only in Istanbul. And it is also only 12 trials in, which is published in Takvim Vekais. And as our work on the subject went deeper, we both saw that the number of trials which took place in Istanbul was much greater uh, than indicated by the information available in Takvim Vekai. We also learned that the trials did not take only in Istanbul. There were trials throughout the Anatolia. Nobody knows about these trials. And uh, the most serious obstacle we faced was that it was almost impossible to uh, get access to information about these trials. Uh, the information on the trials should be found actually in two major archives, theoretically. One is the uh, Başbakanlık Archive, the Prime Ministerial Archive in Istanbul, and the other is the Military Archive, ATAS, Askeri Tarih ve Stratejik Etüt Başkanlığı. This is the, the uh, long name of the uh, Military Archive in Ankara, and the name is Archives of the Directorate for Military History and Strategic Studies. The Istanbul primary, uh, the Prime Minister archive, uh, is open to researchers, but because the documents of that period had not been catalogued in 1990s, uh, when I was working on the topic, it was not possible to find anything on trials in Istanbul archive. Now there are materials there. We don't know uh, the content of it. I made a search in the catalogs and 
I discovered that there are a lot of uh, catalog summaries with the title Divani Harbi Orfi. This is the military tribunal. Uh, so there might be some materials there. The young scholar should go and continue the work on that. Uh, available materials in Istanbul. I'm not so sure what they are. I cannot tell anything about the content of these materials. Secondly, Ankara, uh, why is Ankara is important? Uh, we don't have any documents or files from these court, courts from Istanbul. We have only the verdicts and indictments published in Takvim ve Kayi, the official gazette, and we have some coverages in newspapers. We don't know where about the files, the court materials. And my guess is they might be in Ankara. The reason is because these were military tribunals and Istanbul was taken over by Turkish nationalists November 1922. And it makes sense that the materials of the military court had been transported to Ankara, and it might be somewhere in Ankara in this military archive, and it is close to researchers. Nobody can have access. They only allow their own people to go and to work there. So, because of this problematic aspect of the sources, we had only left the daily newspapers as an important reference, and this had I had to explain each, each and every time. In America, it's very easy. You would say that a newspaper, yeah, you can go to the library and get them and read. Unfortunately, this was not the case. This is not the case in Turkey. You cannot find the newspapers of the period 1919-1922, the Istanbul newspapers, in one library in a complete way. Now you can find now. And this is the, how technology develops, I can tell you. Unfortunately, we spent maybe 15 years very hard to compile all these newspapers together. Now some of them electronically available and online. <laughs> a Japan, a com company from Japan made an agreement with Turkish company, with Turkish uh, uh, library, and they worked hard last two, three years. Now it is possible to get access to some of these newspapers. And for me, it uh, really, we started to compile, to collect these newspapers 1995 and until 2003, 2004. And uh, it is a huge endeavor, and I personally didn't have money and nothing, and it was the Zorian Institute that came up with the uh, fundings, and then we really went from one library to another and tried to compile these newspapers together. I give you some other in interesting examples for the, in order to imagine the newspapers. Uh, they were not in one library, this is one thing. And second, for example, if you go to a library, you think that they have a catalog, and in their catalogs, uh, you will find the, uh, the newspapers that this library has. It's the normal, what you have here. In Ankara, we had, for example, in one library, this is the Milli Kütüphane, the national library in Turkey. You know how the things works in Turkey. We had some friends in library and were able to go to the basement of the uh, library. We discovered some newspapers they don't have in their uh, catalogs. So even they had more than what they had in catalog, but they didn't know. They didn't have a good catalog. So we really compiled all these newspapers and to our surprise, we discovered that really the newspapers covered these trials extensively, and the number of the trials are more than that we know. And from the trials, from the newspapers, we also learned that there were at least in 10 different cities in Anatolia, special military tribunal had been established, and there were court cases, and we know from the newspapers also there were some sentences. But we don't know, we don't have detailed information about these cases, what they were, who were the defendants, and so on. This is really a, really a research topic for the uh, new young generation. Uh, Another important aspect, let me tell you the newspapers. The newspapers covered the uh, 
trials at the beginning extensively. And the number, as I said, 63. I discovered through this research that the entire trials only in Istanbul by the military tribunal number one is 63. And I excluded, we excluded some of the trials which are indirectly related to the Armenian deportations and killings. I gave some examples in the book from uh, uh, selected from these indirectly related trials also. So the directly related trials 63 and the number might be higher. Why? Because when the time passed, even though uh, interrogation were continuing, the interest of newspaper dropped. Because with the increase of Turkish nationalist movement in Anatolia, the uh, press interest on newspaper also dropped, and uh, the coverage was not extensive, and was, you, sometimes we couldn't understand what they were talking about. Uh, and there, another complication is, for one trial, the newspapers gave different names. Nahiye Müdürleri, Bahçecik, İzmit. Three different names actually for the same trial. Or for the same city, let's say Musul, they have three different trials. So you have to really figure out when the newspaper writes Musul trial uh, happened today, then you have to know which one and so on. Because of this, comp this issue, I'm not so sure about the exact numbers. But 62, sure, and I have the list in the book of these 62 trials. And I read you from uh, a newspaper how the, it shows you how the interest dropped and is very difficult to understand. For example, uh, uh, the newspaper Iktam uh, in 19, uh, beginning of 1920, why the uh, interest dropped, especially the 1919 September, there was a government change in Istanbul. Uh, because of the pressure of the Turkish nationalists, the existing Prime Minister Damat Ferit Pasha in Istanbul had to resign and the nationalists won sort of a, a stronghold in Istanbul and along with then the trial was not so much important in Istanbul. And for example now the newspaper Iktam was satisfied with giving the news such as now I'm quoting, quote, the court martial examined the cases of 10 arrested individuals, three of which were connected to the deportation matter, but because time was not sufficient, the trials were left for another day. That's it. So, we don't know which case, which three individual, and so on and so forth. So, uh, if we put all these deficiencies aside, the conclusion we reach is that there are 62 trials which can establish our concern with the deportation and the killings of the Armenians. And now some information about these 63 two, uh, trials. 22 of these 50 trials were completed. Now, 12 in Takvim Vekai, then we discovered new 50 trials. And what about the, these new 50 trials? So 22 of these 50 were completed. And of those, in 17, a verdict of acquittal was given for the accused. Eight trials ended with the verdict that were, there was no need to investigate. <coughs> of the remaining two trials, one was dropped because the accused was deported to Malta. British took him and sent to Malta. And while the other concluded with acquittal for one of the accused and the decision to expand the investigation of the other defendants stayed there. So, but if necessary, to repeat, the, despite all these impossibilities and difficulties, the documents that we published possess a priceless significance. As a result of the importance of the topic, we did not content ourselves with publishing the documents alone, but wrote an unusually long forward. Vahakan Dadrian wrote approximately uh, 150 pages introduction, and myself approximately 100 pages, we explained the various aspects of these trials. The list of the trials, 62, the defendants, 
the, uh, day of uh, the uh, trials and the end of the trials. You can find, and Gadrian made an explicit, wonderful uh, history of the period, the political history of the period. And my articles are basically with the history of the court martial itself and the various stages of the court martials and it develops. And this list shows that the trials were extremely extensive, both in number and in the areas covered. And I think this is one of the important contribution for the uh, putting down the Armenian genocide as such. So now I would like to talk a little bit on some objections uh, related to the uh, trials. As you know, there are some objections raised by certain scholars and uh, I would like to talk on that aspect because in English version we don't have this. This is the other difference between English and uh, Turkish version. In Turkish version we had an extensive article dealt with the question of different objections by different political parties, Turkish government and scholars against these trials and how we really should argue against these trials. And, uh, but this is not in English version because uh, we didn't have time. The book had a really complicated publication history. I don't want to go into detail also. So what are the main objectives to these trials? Uh, it is possible, actually, to summarize five, five different important points. One, it says, the Ottoman legal system did not have the necessary standard for a just trial. This is number one. Number two, the courts represented the justice of victors and were placed on the agenda for the sake of revenge. A like power and the uh, enemies of Union and Progress Party, they wanted to take revenge from Unionist, uh, Union and Progress Party, and so it was a politically motivated trials, not be trusted. Victory, justice. Number three, the accused were tortured, and their rights of defense were restricted or even not at all recognized. Number four, no witnesses were heard throughout the hearings. Number five, it is not right to trust the documents originating in these trials because as the original were lost, it is impossible for us to check their accuracy. So we cannot trust because we don't have the originals. And interestingly enough, all these arguments were brought up extensively by an infamous, famous scholar, Günther Levy. His book had been distributed by Turkish government also, and I will show you how scholarly his book is. So he made these five accusations, but the torture. He never made this point. Uh, some Turkish scholar in Turkey made this point that the uh, defendant were tortured and uh, they were forced to confess certain things and so on and so forth. So let's uh, go over these uh, objections. The first objection is basically that the uh, Ottoman legal system did not have the necessary standards for a just trial, as Günther Levy argues in his book. It is lack of fundamental information on the European legal system. He has no idea, or he knows, but consciously distorts. It is useful to read for this argument Wack and Dadrian's foreword, in particularly uh, the chapter on the Ottoman criminal justice system. And uh, Wacken Dadrian gives extensive information that the Ottoman criminal law and the criminal trial, trial procedures codes are basically taken from European countries. So the all trial procedures in Istanbul basically actually based on French law. This is how they tried in Istanbul because this is the Ottoman legal system. When they reformed the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, they took from France the legal system in the middle of the uh, 19th centuries. So, uh, for this reason, it is absurd to propose that the Ottoman legal system did not have trial standards. Second objection is that the trials were essentially for political goals is a very old one, as you know. There are three arguments against this thesis or this uh, position. 
Number one, first, similar criticism have been made of the Nuremberg courts. And you can make the same cases today for the uh, all the criminal courts in Den Haag, in the uh, Yugoslavian Rwandan court case. And uh, in, for example, uh, in Nuremberg, they argued that it is the victor, victory justice and high class lynching party and so on and so forth. And it is true, actually, as we know. All these kind of trials, politically, determined by the victors. There is no doubt about it. But uh, it would be truly futile to attempt to deny the political character of all these court. Uh, uh, however, the political character of these tribunal, tribunals does not mean that the documents and information obtained and the statements of defendants and witnesses during the trials are invalid. On the contrary, it can be claimed that the documents and information assembled during the duration of the courts are of incalculable value for research being conducted today on mass murders. Now, the other important reason why we can not criticize Istanbul tribunals as politically motivated is the political atmosphere of the period. I'm going to give you some examples to your surprise. So the second more important reason is the political atmosphere prevailing during the Istanbul trials. Unlike the Nuremberg or other similar trials, if we call the Istanbul court martial trial political judgments, we can say that this political momentum to a significant degree turned in favor of unions, actually. The conditions of detention from this point of view is a very important example. I'll talk a little bit about it. And another example, I will give you a very striking example from a court case. This is the one of the most well-known court case, Yozgat trial, because it was the first trial uh, in Istanbul, and the newspapers reported extensively. And there was a defendant. His name was Feyyaz Ali. And uh, Feyyaz Ali, uh, the Yozgat trial started February 5th, 1919. And in the 17th session, altogether it was 20 session, in 17th ses session, which took place 31st March 1919, Feyyaz Ali's file was separated from this trial on the ground that it would be more correct for him to be tried in Yozgat. Okay. Later, however, in a very interesting fashion, he was left free to go to Yozgat by himself. <laughs> and he did. He escaped. He went Ankara and became nationalist. And the member of the national uh, parliament in Ankara, and the first thing that he did, the first important initiative of the Feyyaz Ali was to propose a bill, the pardon of those condemned by court martials. <laughs> this gives you the political atmosphere of the period. So. And we learn more information, but this is the good part of the working on the Turkish newspapers, how important the project. We learn the details of the story uh, in, from Turkish newspaper. One of the judges of these Istanbul trials, they were also changing because of the political character of the regime, and he gave an interview, the judge, uh, August 9, 1920, and uh, his name also Mustafa Pasha, who was the president of the court martial since April 1920, and uh, Pasha made some comments about the practices conducted in the period prior his own, and said, quote, all the documents and papers pertaining to people whom we sentenced in absentia were destroyed, end quote. This is his saying, I'm taking from newspaper. It is very important that the president of the court openly confessed that the investigation files and documents were destroyed. And Mustafa Pasha refers to the trials case Yozgat and Feyyaz Ali, and he mentions Feyyaz's name and says that uh, Feyyaz Ali 
devlet e, e, Feyyaz Ali Free with an unsubstantial letter of guarantee which no reason and logic would be able to accept and allow. According to Pasha, the setting free of a person involved in many crimes and murders is not a behavior that can be forgiven. This is about the political atmosphere of the uh, period. So for us, the important thing is uh, not the political atmosphere, actually, the documents that came out throughout these trials. This is the important part. So let me talk a little bit on the condition of the imprisonment so that you can get more sense of the time period. From 1918-1921, the conditions of house arrests or imprisonments are extremely important because one argument is they were tortured and they were pressured for uh, the, uh, their testimonies and so on, we cannot trust them. Now, I'm, again, I'll give you some information from the daily newspapers of the time and from the memoirs of those who were in prison at that. So for us, the important source, themselves. They wrote a lot of memoirs afterwards. So just some examples. A journalist who was with the first people to be arrested on the, at the police station related later in his memoirs following, quote, the open terrace of the upper floor of the police station in a short time turned into a marketplace. Beautiful food came from homes. Everybody was serving each other. I was witnessing and accounting for a whole area. People were sitting together, eating and enjoying their time. Prison conditions were not different from those who were sent later. An English report, the British uh, report, summarizes the prison conditions as follows, first from the foreigners uh, and then from the original sources. So the British report says, quote, prison conditions uh, let me sum find the uh, quote. So, uh, it says, the captives have friends in particularly every ministry. And they are given permission to have limitless meetings with friends and sympathizers. It is true. We have from the memoirs, they write, I was calling the, uh, from the justice ministry, this and that bureaucrat, and he came and we discussed the trials. So the people were coming from the ministries and debating the court cases with the defendant in prison. And this is in the British report also. And also the individuals totaling 112 people are permitted to go out of the prison during the day. Visitors to the prison are not subject to any searches when entering except random glances and they are observed bringing in large packages which they sometimes claim are food, but can also be anything else. And another report continues, women can come all day whenever they want and never are subject to search. So, as hard as it may be to believe, the information mentioned in the English report that the defendants were free to leave the prison whenever they wished is true. Those who left the prison, most of the time returned in a few days, not wanting it to be shameful for the prisoner director. <laughs> and, for example, Tevfik Rüşte Aras, who later became Turkish foreign minister in the Republic period, 17 years he served as the foreign minister, and he was one of the defendants. In his memoirs, he tells us the following, quote, two or three weeks after this incident, incident May 1919, the British uh, took approximately 70, 80 prisoners and sent them to Malta uh, because they wanted their own uh, trials, uh, British. So then uh, Tevfik Rüşte Aras says, uh, two or three weeks after these incidents, during one of the one-day permits that I occasionally received, as the prison director Ali Bey, who was my friend, said that day, I am temporarily released. I did not return to the prison in the evening. The prison director could give permission for causes such as going to the doctor or taking a bath 
initially in the company of four soldiers with bayonets and one officer, and later only with one officer. Thinking that it would be easy for us to escape from these guards, he later began to give permission on condition that we promised to return. In fact, he continues, this giving our word turned out to be the most difficult thing for us, because after promising, we could not play such a good prison director in a difficult situation. <laughs> so this is from his memoirs. As a result of this freedom, many incidents of escape took place. Dr. Reshid, the infamous governor of Diyarbakir, fled January 25, 1919, and the escape was actually not an escape. He didn't come back. He left for the bath and didn't come back. And Enver Pasha's uncle, Halil Pasha, and the other well-known unionist, Küçük Talat Bey, they fled, and during the entire period, the reason for there not being more escapes was the internees did not want to flee. And I'm jump jumping uh, from the, you can read, uh, no, you cannot read this, only in Turkish part. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, uh, we know uh, from the uh, cases, uh, really, they planned to empty the entire prison. Because almost all guards in the prison were the member of the Union and Progress Party. And I'm, I took it from a memoir who was involved in this process of emptying the prison. He wrote in his memoir, say that, I went in the prison and we had a long discussion and nobody wanted to get out. They all believed that they will be free in any way in a couple of months, and they will be in the power. This is what they believed, and this was the reason why they didn't leave the free, uh, prison. So this is, <clears throat> if this, I mean, they really wanted to, they could easily empty it, the uh, entire uh, prison. Other arguments uh, of Günther Levy, now, this is the political atmosphere of the period, and you get a sense of the political atmosphere. And uh, the other, the claim that the witnesses were not heard in the trials and witness testimonies were not consulted. He writes this in his book very seriously. Only in one trial, this is the main trial, what we call, because of the character of the trial, it was against the cabinet ministers, and you could not have the witnesses, of course, and but all other trials, you have witnesses. Witnesses were heard. Not only that, basically the verdicts based on witness testimonies. And you can find all this information in the book again. So, this is another really baseless uh, argument. The claim that defendants had no opportunities to see the documents presented or checked whether they were originally is also originals is com also complete false and is based on lack of information and the weakest evidence. All documents and witness testimonies used in the cases were seen by defendants and lawyers and submitted for their approval and comments. I'll give you only one example. During the ninth session of the Yozgat trial on February 22, 1919, Kayseri Division Commander Colonel Shahab Bey, called as a defense witness, was confronted with a surprise. The public prosecutor brought out some telegrams belonging to him. Shahab wanted to deny that they were his. After the committee asked the judge, do you wish to see the telegraph, sir? He responded, it is not necessary. Of course, it is true, sir. And accepted that he had sent the telegram. And you know from Wahakan Dadrian's uh, lectures here several times, he loves to give uh, the uh, expression, aslına mutabıktır, aslına muafıktır, it confirms the original. The documents that had been used in the in trials were basically confirmed by the Justice Ministry that it confirms the original. So the original materials were used 
uh, extensively uh, so that we know that they were original. Another important information, which Günther Leyva argues, since he says that these are some quotes from certain documents from Vehip Pasha, Vehip Pasha, the Third Army commander, and his testimony was crucial in certain uh, trials, and uh, the argument of Günther Levy is, yeah, uh, we can only read in court uh, record certain quotes from Vehip Pasha's testimony, and we don't have the entire document. So, how should we know that it didn't taken out from the content? So, it is not trusted. So, I give you what are the original sources of Vey Pasha's testimony. Number one, not only in different trials his testimony were read, we know that in the trial record, but also the daily newspaper published extensively the entire text. It is there. In Vakit newspaper, the entire testimony of Vey Pasha printed, had been printed. And another important information, exact the same document is available in Jerusalem archive. Vakan Dadrian had the example, I mean, the a copy of this trial, and we compared the quotes in court trials, newspaper, Vakit 1919, and Jerusalem archive, uh, Vahid Pasha testimonies, they three are all identical. So, it is possible to find exactly the same, some materials. Couple of telegrams, which were used in the trials, which is in the indictment, we have now in these days, some of them in Prime Ministerial Archive in Istanbul, and also a copy of them in Jerusalem Archive. So there are different ways also to uh, justify, to prove the originality of these materials. So it is also very important. We can follow these uh, for each and every document. In summary, the documents and information that emerged during the Istanbul trials are among the primary sources that can enlighten us on 1915 and the events connected to it. And from this point of view, have a priceless value. There is one important question to be asked here. Why Günther Levy, even though he is a scholar, he writes all these? And my only answer is, yeah, denial is, denialism must something like that. There is no other explanation. Knowingly distorting the facts. This is what he did, unfortunately. So I think I would like to stop here. I can talk and talk because there is another important aspect you might have heard. This is the other important discussion or the objection uh, in by Turkish government or some uh, denials. They argue that there were some investigations against the uh, perpetrator, even 1915-16. There were some trials. So it cannot be called genocide because Ottoman government also investigate the misdeed against the Armenians. This is a very famous argument and they use a number also. They say that during this investigation 1,397 people were charged and there were cases against them and some of them were sentenced to death penalties and so on. They used this as an argument that 1915 was a genocide and the Ottoman government really took everything uh, for, to prevent the killing of the Armenians during that period. And extensively I uh, worked on that also. Uh, indeed, there were trials, 1915-16, and but these trials were against those who plunder Armenian properties because state wanted the properties for themselves. And there is no one single trial against those individuals who committed crimes against the Armenians, but there are several court cases against those individuals who plunder Armenian properties for their personal uses. So this is other 
important information. I think I stop here and we can talk more. Thank you very much for listening. Regarding the trials, there were not much censorship because the British authorities were responsible. And uh, to my knowledge, there were limited cases, but mostly Istanbul press were free to report on trials and on Armenian atrocities. This is the other project that Nairi mentioned uh, that I planned. Uh, by the way, uh, I have to mention one important issue for me. Uh, it was originally also my idea to publish with Vahak and Dadrian to overcome one basic issue that bothers me a lot. Because of this uh, Turkish policy, Turkish government's denial policy, we, there is a sense of, there is an understanding that there is an Armenian position, there is a Turkish position, there is Turkish scholar, there is Armenian scholar. Actually, we are all human beings and we have the same feelings, same reason and same way of judgment about the historic wrongdoings and so we have to overcome as scholars at least to write a common book on a topic which we call crime against humanity. So this was for me also important to overcome this hurdle, this, this per false perception that a Turk and an Armenian, whatever their ethnic origins are, they can write a book on a topic like Armenian genocide. There is no Turkish perspective or Armenian perspective in that sense. This is very important. Uh, but I forgot what I want to say and answer the second question uh, regarding the uh, Armenian witnesses. Who were they? Uh, they were some survivors. How it works in the following way. Uh, the British uh, occupied forces in Istanbul set up a Greek-Armenian commission. It was a sub-commission within the British High Commissar in Istanbul. And Patriarch, the Armenian Patriarch were also representing there. And they had regularly meetings and they collected as much information as possible. And then some of the Armenians survivors were in Istanbul and they tried to bring these Armenians to the court. So this is, the, in Yozgat case, we have uh, Armenians survived the Yozgat massacre. In Trabzon court case, we have the survivor Armenians. Uh, in, for example, in another case, uh, it's Katibi uh, Mesullar, the, the trials uh, related to party secretaries of the Union and Progress Party, and they were also uh, accused or charged for killing Armenian intellectuals in central Anatolia. As you know, April 24, approximately 240 of them were deported to Ayash and Chankar in two different places, and most of them were killed. Some of them could come back. Uh, approximately 40, 50 of them came back to Istanbul, and for example, in Istanbul court case against party secretaries of Union and Progress Party, one doctor, the other pharmacist, some intellectual from Istanbul were also 
as uh, at the court as witnesses. This is somewhat built on the same question. <coughs> One, were there missionary witnesses? And secondly, uh, were the foreign press allowed in those trials? Yes, foreign press were allowed, and also, uh, as Nairi mentioned in his introduction, uh, there were also uh, a French newspaper, Renaissance, the owner was an uh, Armenian man, but uh, so the repo uh, giving reports was uh, possible. At the beginning, there was a certain, you can read in the history, a very short period of time they banned the uh, journalists to enter the trials. But overall, throughout the entire period, it was possible. It's, uh, only in one court case, there is a written testimony of an American missionary in favor of the defendants. Uh, that the defendants is a good man, he saved the Armenian lives, and so on and so forth. Uh, but beyond that, there is no other Armenian missionary eyewitnesses to my knowledge. Yes, Abu. I have a question in regards to the trial. Uh, from what I recall, there were three paintings. Uh, but I, I had a glimpse in your book, and it looks like there were more than three hangings during the trial. Uh, Yes and no. Istanbul Military Tribunal handed down approximately 16 death penalties. Most of them were in absentia. Talat, Enver, Jamal, and so on, they were all sentenced to death penalty in absentia. Only three were hanged by the court martial number one in Istanbul. This is the Boazlian uh, uh, County Executive Kemal, hanged April 1999, and uh, the other is the Nusret, uh, I forgot now from which city, I'm sorry, uh, and uh, third one is from the Erzincan trial. They were both hanged in August 1920, so there were only three cases. There were other hanging also. What were they? Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, Vehip Pasha, the army commander of the third army, he was a good man in that sense. Uh, he tried 1916 three gendarmerie officers who were in charge of deporting 2,000 Armenians from Sabastia, Sivas, and to Diyarbakir region. And these Armenian, 2,000 Armenian soldiers were killed on their way massacre. And Dr. Uh, Vehip Pasha, the army commander, uh, tried these gendarmerie officers who were responsible for this case, and they gave a testimony. The, we can learn from the newspapers and the perhaps, uh, Vehip Pasha's testimony also, that they told that the killings order they got from Bahattin Shakir. Uh, and uh, this is how we know this, another important source. And two of these gendarmerie officers were hanged by Vehip Pasha. There were some other hangings also. Jamal Pasha, I now don't know the exact number. We know that from not from the Ottoman sources, from German sources. We made a list in the book on these cases. Uh, Jamal Pasha hanged also, I think, two or three uh, Kurdish uh, tribal leaders because of the attacking the Armenian uh, camps in uh, Aleppo and the areas. And this was Jamal Pasha's own initiative. So this is the entire story with the hangings. There were other executions, but it has nothing to do with the trials, actually. One of the Teşkilat-ı Mahsusas member, maybe some of them have heard maybe his name, Yakup Cemil. He, he was one of the murderers, I mean, leader of the, one of the Teşkilat-ı Mahsusa group, and he was in charge of killing a lot of Armenians uh, in eastern Anatolia, in Erzurum and the surrounding regions. He was also hanged in 1916 in Istanbul, but not because of the issues related to genocide, because he wanted to organize a coup d'etat against Enver in Istanbul. And there were other cases also, Cherkez Ahmet, the murderer of the uh, uh, Zohrab, uh, the Armenian deputy uh, Zohrab, he was also uh, executed by Talat and Jamal together. 
they thought he would be very dangerous for the uh, Union and Progress Party. So you have you can find the entire list of these individuals in the book. Yes. I have two questions. Number one, what did the British have to gain from these trials? I mean, first of all, they were involved and they stood behind and they did this whole massacre happen. They didn't do a thing. So what did they have to gain with these trials? Question number one. Question number two, I recently read your article where you were saying that Karantin's murder is actually a revenge for Atatürk. Talat Pasha. Oh, Talat Pasha. And, uh, and then you said that, um, and you were drawing similarities, and you said when Tatirian killed Talat Pasha, he took him to death. Now, my memory of reading the book is that he went to kill him, he gave Talat Pasha a name, and he turned, and that's when he killed him. So can you elaborate on that? What is the correct version? So, uh, first of all, the, on the British role on the trial, this is a very interesting question, and it's, uh, really it puzzles me a lot. I don't have any answer to the question that I'm elaborating. I'm going to talk about it now. As you know, the British really could control Istanbul. They could enter the prisons, and they had access to every administrative uh, branch in Istanbul, and they didn't show any interest for these trials. They considered these as a show trials, and this was the reason why they, in 1919 May, when the Greek forces landed in Smyrna, uh, there was a turmoil and the Ottoman government was under pressure and they uh, released a couple of prisoners from Istanbul and the British understood that the development is not so good in Istanbul and they arrested, they took over from the prison approximately 120 prisoners and brought them all to Malta Island. The question that I don't have any answer is following. British later tried to try these individuals in Malta. They tried to establish their own courts. And uh, as you know, this is used by uh, the Turkish deniers as a major argument. They, they had the argument saying that, you know, British could not find any documents. So British cannot try this individual because they were not responsible for genocide or any other act. So British had to release them. It is very interesting, and I don't have any answer why British authorities didn't ask Ottomans for materials. Even though these materials were available in Istanbul, in court cases, it was never asked by British and never used. So my understanding, number one, the issue of human rights and the try the criminals, perpetrators for the crime that they committed was not very high in that period. Number two, uh, during that period, Mustafa Kemal and Turkish nationalists, they were smart enough they arrested some British, British soldiers and British citizens, and then they exchanged with the Malta prisoner. So the British first interest was to save their own prisoners. Uh, because of all these reasons, British never tried to set up their own tribunals in Istanbul. So if you look the Malta documents in British archives, it is really very thin. You know, it is something different to know that a crime was organized by an individual, for example, governor of Sivas, the Muammar, everybody knows he is responsible for these killings, but in order to have a uh, court case against him, you have some documents against him. If you don't have any document, you cannot charge. This was the case, and uh, British, unfortunately, didn't follow the legal procedure and never asked the materials from Istanbul court martial. Uh, second, the Talat Pasha uh, case, uh, this is a very important and interesting uh, issue. This is an article that I wrote after Hrant Dink assassination. Main problem that I had with this article is following. Uh, whatever happens in Turkey, you Armenians, you bring that always mid-1915 in connection. For you, this is the center point. And which event occurs, you immediately try to find a connection. In Turkey, it's just the opposite. <coughs> I have a lot of friends, good friends, intellectuals. <coughs> they are friends of Hrant also. They fight for Hrant, they go on the street, they chant, we are all Armenians, 
we are all Hrans, okay. but they don't like to bring Hrans assassination with 1915 together. They don't like it. For them, 1915 is something somewhere, and Hrans assassination is something different. My first purpose was to show that actually for the perpetrator it was not the case. Yal Doğan, Hayal, Yasin Hayal, the, one of the organizers of the uh, Hrans uh, assassination, he's a thug, he's a stupid idiot. He was trained in prison, we know now. Educated on Armenian genocide and on Talat's assassination. When he came out from the prison, we know from court records, from his father's uh, testimonies, he explained to his father about Talat's assassination. And he also mentioned his father that Talat's murderer got free. He was acquitted. And bringing all these together, for me, it was clear. It was not the... I use this as a metaphor. Hrant Dink was not killed to take revenge from Talat. But the setup was exactly the same way as how Tehlerian assassinated Talat. On the open street, coming from the behind, I'm not so sure whether he called Hrant and Hrant could turn, but exactly the same setup. You know, we have a lot of assassinations in Turkey, political assassination, during 1990s. Shocking number, 17,000 civilians were killed by paramilitary groups in Turkey. This is the Human Rights Organization's report. Nobody knows the exact numbers. We call them the perpetrator unknown murder cases. In all these cases, the poor individual were taken in a car, killed somewhere, and dumped the body somewhere else. They could have done the same to Hrant. They could have killed him in a thousand different ways. <clears throat> Why in front of Agos? Because it is the voice of Armenians. Why on the street? Why from coming back? In Tahlerian case, he came from the back and called Talat's name. This is the reason that the Talat could turn back. But same scenario, coming from back, and also, as you know, Tehlerian actually should not escape. He should stay and let him uh, cut by the police or individuals and defend the case, which then turned out in that way. And we know that actually there was a similar decision. Ogun Samad should not escape, at least should not leave Istanbul. And this was the reason why they organized this ceremony with police officers in something you may remember, with flag and so on, to defend the case. They believed, they made him believe that he did something good. So my idea was to show Turkish civil society, Turkish intellectual and my friends also. You know, even though you don't want to bring this event 1915 together, the perpetrators, they are so aware what they are doing. They are in conscience of 1915. Of course, they killed Hiram for other political reasons, to organize a military coup d'etat, and so on and so forth, but his being an Armenian was also important. So this is the reason why I made this, I use this metaphor. And it's important for me. Any other question? Yes. On, um about the witnesses, my mind goes into the movie, The Lark Farm. Now, are, have you come across Turkish officers or Turkish uh, politicians or Turkish <laughs> officials or eyewitnesses in being witnesses against those uh, who are being tried or only they look at some Armenians and some foreign uh, foreigners as witnesses? Thank you very much for the question. It's a very important question. Just read, for example, Erzincan trial as a case, or Bible trial verdicts in the book. You will be stunned. 
the name of Turkish officers. The court basically prefer Turkish witnesses than the Armenian witnesses. And in most cases, the judgments were based on Turkish testimonies. This is another important part, really based going through these verdicts and trials and picking out the names of the Turks and the Muslims, we can really write another history of 1915. Boazlian uh, County Executive Kemal, he was hanged, basically also there were a lot of witnesses against him, but because of the testimony of the Müftü, the religious leader of the Boazlia, Abdullah Bey, he, I used his testimony uh, in one of my books as the uh, uh, book cover. During, we read this in these trials, for, let me give you another example. In Kastamon, for example, a group of Muslims really attacked the governor's office and threatened governor saying that Armenians are our neighbors. You cannot send them away. Give us our neighbors. And the villagers, the peasants, the people were kicked out from governor's office. In Yozgat case, you will read from the trial <coughs> documents. Where the killing was happening, the group of villagers went there and tried to prevent and asked Kemal, saying that it is not in Quran. You cannot kill innocents. It is against Quran. And Kemal threatened them to be killed. So they had to escape and save their own lives. And in different court cases, army officers, Behip Pasha, third army commander, or in Trabzon case, Adli Pasha, the marine officer, very important individual, and uh, the governor of uh, Ankara, Masar Bey, you will find all these names. They gave testimonies. For example, one of the governors gave the testimony saying that uh, when one party secretary came, and gave him the order for killing of Armenians. He said that I'm a bureaucrat, I'm a man of the honor, I cannot put my hands in blood. If you want to do that, come to my place. And he was removed from the office. So there are testimonies, and most of the court cases, the judgment based on the Turkish testimonies. Yes. Um. Yeah, I've got a question about this, you know, the pro your project for uh, putting together a repository of, uh, you know, common repository of information. Um, about um, five, six years ago, the late uh, Donald Potter wrote an article talking about uh, the collapse of the wall of silence. He was uh, citing uh, a block from his work, saying that there was going to be more and more um, research onto, you know, the genocide and what was uh, just in that period. Um, do you see that happening or, um, you know, in the past six years? Or? I think I repeated several times at Nasser meetings and in, at every meeting I try to repeat this information. This is important. There are Turkish students who want to work on genocide. They apply to my graduate program at uh, Clark University. We cannot fund them. There is a genuine interest in Turkey among the students to work on this topic and more and more people are coming and talking on that issue. And we have to really support the graduate programs and really educate Turkish students. It is there. There is a genuine basis in Turkey. I have to repeat this again. I repeat each and every time. Hranting case, you may not understand the importance of what he changed in Turkey. He's an Armenian, he's not a Turk. He was not a very well-known Turk. We have, or we had a lot of well-known Turks in Turkey who were assassinated. Ur Mumcu, Muammer Aksoy, I can give you names. Very famous public figures, intellectuals, beloved. Thousands of people came to their funerals. After one year, everybody forget them. Nobody talks about these individual assassinated, very important Turkish individual. Since Hrant's assassination, 
at every court case, there were at least 500 people. Every court case, none of Turkish cases you could see that. Every year at the Hrant's anniversary, the number of people participated in demonstrations increased. Last year, 40,000. Turkey hasn't experienced such a thing. This man, with his death, created an incredible thing in Turkey. He opened, maybe because of the shame that we had, because of that we feel ourselves guilty against this individual and against Armenians. I don't know the reason, but first time you have a very strong civil society in Turkey. They need our attention, they need our support. This is what we really should take into consideration. Yes? Is that the reason for the publication in Turkish? Could you talk about how this is going to be disseminated? This is one of the reasons. The other reason, I'm a very, very Turk, actually. I like to publish first in Turkish. I joke sometimes with Mark, saying that Turkish language is now the leading language in Armenian Jews. <laughs> Uh, there is a conscious policy. Uh, I started doing so with a purpose because, you know, we were always attacked as prisoner threat uh, of the country and, and so on and so forth. And uh, for that, and something that we are writing something in English or other languages and hiding this from our people. So knowing all these attacks in early period, 1990s, I made a decision for myself. First in Turkish, then in other. So to show that there is no uh, differences using different languages, yes. Van, and I couldn't get like true recipes from Van, but then at the Philadelphia opening, I ran into um, Liberty, who was Agony's daughter. She, she must be in her 80s, 90s, I think, at this point. She came with her family, and I was asking her about the recipes, so I've got, I've got to call her, actually, because we're curious about, you know, all of us have 